2023 was a great year for games. I don't think anyone could argue with that. Some people could argue that it hasn't been such a great year for game developers, and indeed we'll see someone make that argument rather eloquently in a little while. But in terms of games, I'm willing to call 2023 the best year of the millennium. So far, anyway. My time-travelling sources tell me that 2391 is going to be pretty damn amazing when they finally perfect direct neural connections. Unfortunately, 2392 is pretty much going to be the Matrix, but it'll be fun while it lasts. For me, the two biggest games of the year were Final Fantasy XVI and Baldur's Gate 3. Not everyone loved FF16 as much as I did, but BG3 received almost universal acclaim, and deservedly so. From my perspective, those two games alone are almost enough to make this the best year for gaming this millennium, as I can't think of any year in recent decades where two games I've loved so much have come out in the same year. Add to that Theatre Rhythm Final Bar Line, which is a much more niche title, but to me almost as significant, and yeah, 2023 was a hell of a year. But even taking a more objective, less personal perspective, there have been so many games that have done so much right, and even if they're not necessarily top of my list, I can acknowledge that they're pretty damn great. Some of these I've played, some I haven't, but I can still see the massive appeal. Tears of the Kingdom, for instance. No surprises there. Lies of P was a surprise for me. A Bloodborne game that actually really isn't, but it's still awesome. Then there was Armored Core 6, a long-awaited sequel to a sadly dormant series that had me truly excited. And Street Fighter 6, which actually did a lot to reignite my passion for the series. And Diablo 4, which did a lot to, well, extinguish my passion for that series. But hey, loads of people loved it. There was Spider-Man 2, not something that really interests me, but apparently it's awesome. There were remasters like Metroid Prime and Resident Evil 4 and Super Mario RPG, all games I loved in their original form, though I haven't played the updated versions. There was that new Mario game, which I probably would have played if I had a Switch and a lot of money. Maybe, I don't know. I'm kind of over Mario. But hey, people loved that one too. And there was more. Octopath Traveler 2 and Sea of Stars both threw back to an older style of JRPG and both excellent. Cyberpunk 2077 got an expansion which a lot of people seem to think finally brings up the game close to a level that justifies some of the initial hype. Alan Wake 2 seems intriguing, I'm sure I'll play it sometime in the next couple of decades. Hi-Fi Rush was highly acclaimed by many people who aren't me, but hell, I liked it quite a bit. I just didn't love it as much as some. Starfield was released as well. All these games are ones I absolutely love, or hugely respect, or find really interesting, or really want to play. And there's Starfield. And for someone like me, who is a bit jaded and cynical and honestly finds it tough at times to think of recent games that I have even a basic interest in, the fact that I can list so many is really a testament to how good a year it was. But there was one particular way that I think 2023 was special, and that's the way that game voice actors truly became stars. Now of course, depending on how you look at it, this is a highly debatable claim. You could say that game voice actors have been proper stars for ages, and point to the likes of Nolan North, Troy Baker, Yuri Lowenthal, and plenty of other well-known names. Or, conversely, you could claim that voice actors known primarily for their work in games still aren't true stars, as they haven't reached the fame levels of the Hollywood elite. And that's fine, I'm really not here to argue, I'm just giving my perspective. And for me, 2023 was the year that the people and the personalities behind the performances in the games I love most really entered my consciousness and took on a life beyond the games themselves. Plus, in FF16 and Baldur's Gate 3, we got the two games with my favourite voice performances ever. And I kind of want to pay tribute to that. This is just a personal opinion, of course, but I don't think I'll be the only one who holds it. Many people will point to Rockstar's games, and there have been plenty of comic book adaptations that have capitalised on some truly fantastic talent. But, well, I have a confession to make. I just prefer British accents. I'm an accentist, I guess. As an Australian, I'd like to think I'm fairly neutral. But then again, on the rare occasions we get Australian accents in games, I experience a sort of cultural cringe that makes it all a bit discomforting for me. And given my personal cultural heritage, it's probably not surprising I have a natural affinity for British accents. And that affinity has only been strengthened by the fact I spend most of my time watching British panel shows and sitcoms. So yeah, I really don't want to downplay the excellent work done by American performers. But not going to lie, in this video I'm going to be focusing almost exclusively on British ones. But that's incidental. All I want to do really is highlight some of the performances that really stood out for me and give some respect to the people behind them. Let's start with Baldur's Gate 3. It has a true ensemble cast of characters, all of whom are brilliant. None of them overshadow or are overshadowed by the others, and every player will have their own favourite voice performances, so I could have picked any or all of them to lavish praise on here. But in the interest of time, both yours and mine, I'll just mention a few. 
Well, maybe more than a few, but certainly not all of them. Some minor to moderate spoilers for the game coming up, by the way, regarding the character of Gale at least. Everything else is pretty much right from the start of the game. Firstly then, Tim Downey as Gale. Now, as a huge fan of British sitcoms, anyone who's ever been in one is basically a god to me, and Tim has had featured roles in two of the best in recent years. He played Danny Bear in Toast of London. Very, very good. Um, let's just try without the script. Mind just loosen you up a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's, what is it, one word? You don't really need it, do you? I probably don't need the script, it's just a word. And Marlowe in Ben Elton's historical comedy Upstart Crow. Emilia. Emilia. By God, I'd like to feel ya. He also appeared in one episode of Peep Show, which, if pressed, I would say is my favourite sitcom of the millennium so far. But I would honestly say that his performance in Baldur's Gate 3 is my favourite. He perfectly captures the essence of Gale, a powerful wizard who has suffered a rather drastic downfall. Well met, stranger. You find yourself in the presence of the renowned wizarding prodigy Gale of Waterdeep. Please, no need to be intimidated. He is witty, a touch pompous, a trifle arrogant, but not without some justification. He has an eloquent way of speaking and a sense of humour tinged with cynicism. But underneath the wit and cynicism is a great depth of feeling that encompasses love and loss, and a keen understanding of both beauty and tragedy. And alongside it all is the hint of a threat, the sense that Gale's lust for power may yet be reignited. Speaking of lust, as you may know if you've seen much of the promotional material around Baldur's Gate 3, the ability to romance the character of your choosing was a key selling point of the game. The fact that one of the romances you could undertake involved a druid in bear form became something of a meme. I went into the game not thinking too much about that side of things, I can be a soppy romantic at times for sure, but the whole bear sex thing made me think the romances were not something the game was going to take seriously. But in a natural and organic process, my character found themselves drawn to Gale and his charming ways, so I went along with it and was astounded to find that the main romance scene with Gale was one of the most profoundly beautiful things I've seen in any game. I love this time of night. There's an almost reverent silence that accompanies the peak of darkness. When you'd almost believe the dawn will never break. The cradle of eternity. The timelessness of lovers. That most beautiful of fantasies. Even the actual sex was, well, kind of surreal to be honest, in a Dr. Manhattan kind of way, but still remarkable. Obviously the writing needs to be great to make a romance in a video game feel like something substantial and it truly is great here. And the art and animation deserves praise too. But to bring life to a character as complex and nuanced as this is one hell of an achievement for a voice actor. And it's not just because I loved him in several of my favourite sitcoms that I esteem his performance so highly. In fact I'd been playing for a good few hours before I realised that this was in fact the Tim Downey. But from the first moment I met the character of Gale, I found his breezy, silver-tongued way of speaking to be effortlessly charismatic and appealing. Baldur's Gate 3 also gave us Neil Newborn as Astarian, arguably the game's most popular and recognisable character, performed by one of its most popular and recognisable voice actors. Hello, darling. Don't be shy. I promise not to bite until we've been formally introduced. After all, this is the guy who won for Best Performance at the Game Awards. And deservedly so, Astarian is a deceptively difficult character to portray. You might think at first that he carries all the standard tropes of his archetype, an evil, foppish vampire, haughty, aloof, bloodthirsty. And he could so easily have been a cliché, but Baldur's Gate 3 does not stoop to tropes or clichés, at least not before turning them on their head in imaginative ways, and Neil Newborn artfully steers Astarian away from caricature and towards something much deeper and more interesting. My name's Astarian. I was in Baldur's Gate when those beasts snatched me. His performance is flamboyant, no doubt, but there's so much more to it than that. There is real savagery to it, but also real vulnerability. There's a hell of a lot of humour in his performance, both of the sort where you're laughing with the character and at him. Depending on how you play the game and the perspective you take, you'll either love Astarian or love hating him, but you'll sure as hell remember him, and his voice will be playing in your mind for a long time. However, I think my personal favourite character in the game is someone else. In fact, they're kind of not really a character at all, but they are nevertheless possibly the most important of all in setting the tone of the game and bringing the player into its world. I am of course referring to the narrator, voiced by Amelia Tyler. 
The exposed brain quivers in expectation. No matter how you choose to play the game, hers will probably be the voice you hear most. And by God, what a voice it is. Warm, smooth, expressive, calm, commanding, oozing with authority. You realize you're talking to an intellect devourer, a minion of the mind flayers who abducted you. She is the voice of the dungeon master guiding you through this experience and the voice of the world itself. In a way, she is the strongest link the game has back to the world of tabletop gaming, where there's no orchestral score, no fancy 3D graphics, no beautifully rendered settings, unless perhaps you were particularly keen on drawing or sculpting and made some of your own. D&D was a story you shared with friends, one that was presented to you by the DM, and in the role of Dungeon Master, Amelia Tyler truly excels. This is another challenging role for any voice actor. She needs to maintain a certain distance. She's your guide in the world of Baldur's Gate, but she is not of that world. She relates the observations and realizations of your character, but she's not a character herself. If she tried to put too much of her personality into the narrator, it would feel awkward and out of place. But if she didn't put any personality into it, the whole game would seem less full of life. Fortunately, she achieves the balance perfectly, and in the end, the narrator feels as much like a companion as any of the other characters, one that you never see but who sits behind your shoulder, dripping honeyed words into your ear as you try to make sense of this strange new world. Now, it seems totally unfair to not talk about all the other characters and voice actors in Baldur's Gate 3, because every single one of them does an excellent job. And I mean every single one, from the most prominent characters down to the most random NPC you'll converse with for 10 seconds in an alleyway. I can't even briefly list a few other favourites because they are truly all favourites. No, no, I have to at least mention the other Origin characters and their performances, they're just too damn awesome. Samantha Bayart as Karlak is sometimes scary but always adorable. She put a hellfire engine in my chest and made me her prized soldier. But I've escaped now. Thank you, Mind Flayers. Devorah Wild as Lazel gives Astarian a run for his money in the haughtiness stakes but adds a sharp edge of contempt. There is no flesh I will not carve, and no barrier I will not shatter to see it done. I am the one who sunders. I am the Undying Queen's most unshakable warrior. I am Lazel of Kaleer. Theo Solomon as Will is dignified, virtuous, but conflicted. My name is Will, but the people of the Sword Coast call me the Blade of Frontiers. Champion of the meek, defender of the innocent. The truth isn't quite so simple, but they're right about one thing. I hunt monsters and I always catch my prey. Jennifer English as Shadowheart is driven by devotion to cast aside her humanity. My name is Shadowheart, loyal servant of Shah, goddess of darkness and loss. There is little more I can tell you than that. My Lady Shah tasked me with a mission of such secrecy that I surrendered great swathes of my memory in order to safeguard the knowledge of it. And there are other companions, Halsin, Minthara, Jahira, Minsk, that I didn't even interact with much in my playthrough of the game, but from what I've seen they're all excellent too. Even the cats and the dogs and the owlbears have amazing voice actors behind them. Just a bad dream. It's alright. Goblins had me in a cage. Poked me with pointy sticks. Hush now, it was just a nightmare. We're safe here with Mistress. Hell, J.K. Simmons and Jason Isaacs, both major stars, play villains in Baldur's Gate 3 and do it brilliantly, and I haven't even mentioned them until now. I swear, this game is just a miracle of voice acting. But to my mind at least, it wasn't the only downright miraculous game to come out in 2023. So let's just move on to Final Fantasy 16. Once again, there may be some spoilers here. I've tried to keep everything as vague as possible, but there are moments that I wanted to bring up that if you're particularly sensitive to spoilers, you might not want to see at all. In literally any other year, Baldur's Gate 3 would easily, easily have been the game with the best voice acting. And hell, it may still be. But in Final Fantasy 16, it has one hell of a competitor. I'll just start off here by saying straight out that Ben Starr, the actor behind FF16's protagonist Clive, this year became not just one of my favourite voice actors, but simply one of my favourite people in the whole world of gaming. I'll get onto the reasons why a little later, but for now I just want to focus on FF16 and his performance within it. Unlike Baldur's Gate 3, this game has a definite central protagonist and Clive is it. So much rides on Ben Starr's shoulders, 
And fortunately his shoulders are broad indeed, both metaphorically and literally. What a hunk. But he's more than just a challenge to my staunch heterosexuality. He's an actor of both great power and great nuance. Thirteen years. Without the faintest glimmer of hope. It was only Joshua that kept me going. I swore that I would avenge his death. Kime's journey takes him from a privileged youth shattered by tragedy and betrayal, through years of indentured servitude to uncertain freedom, then more years of struggle and strife alleviated by moments of love, tenderness and friendship. Do you know why you're our best scout? Because you don't need anyone to hold your hand. Without your resourcefulness, your courage, your determination, I don't know where we'd be. Maybe hanging off a cliff like, uh... That was only the once. And at the end of it all, well, no spoilers, but some of the best moments and Ben Starr's best work come near the end. But throughout this entire journey, Ben's performance is just so perfectly on the mark. His emotional range is incredible, he can do it all, and he can do it convincingly. And that really is saying something, to portray the extremes of remorse and despair, of triumph and rage, and make it sound authentic and not remotely overwrought is an incredible skill. Joshua's every waking moment was spent trying to shoulder the burden that you and the Phoenix and the Duchy foisted on him. That's why I became his shield. To help bear the weight. But what did you do? You betrayed your own blood and surrendered your son to his fate! It helps that the quality of the writing is fantastic, especially for a Final Fantasy game. I think I've mentioned in the past that voice acting has sometimes been a two-edged sword with Final Fantasy games in my opinion, because while I love the stories and the overall narratives, the moment-by-moment -moment writing is sometimes a little lacking, a little awkward, and having it performed out loud just makes the awkwardness all the more noticeable. This is absolutely not the case with 16. I imagine that has a lot to do with the fact that the game was developed from the ground up with a Western audience in mind, so there are few if any translation issues, but the writing is just high quality by any measure and Ben's performance elevates it even further. I'm prepared to make the big call. This is the best voice acting performance I've heard in any game ever. Of course, Clive is not the only important character in the game, even if he is well and truly at the forefront. Baldur's Gate 3 may have a broader range of characters to interact with, but FF16 still has an incredible core cast of companions who help Clive on his journey, and of course villains to stand in his way and get smashed into the ground. Both of these groups include fantastic characters and equally fantastic performers. Needless to say, being a Britcom fan, I knew of Ralph Einstein from his breakout role as the deplorable Finchie from The Office, and indeed that's a connection I made in a previous video. He also had a small but important role in Chernobyl, the excellent drama series that made waves a little while back, and he's been in some other fairly well-known stuff that I haven't seen. But as with Tim Downey, it's his work in a game that I think is his best. Come now. Fleet as flame, fierce as a wildfire. That there was the blessing of the Phoenix. I'd heard rumours that you'd survived, but I never paid them much heed. He has a deep, gravelly baritone that makes a reedy nasal type like me feel a touch inadequate. And as Sid in FF16, he betrays Clive's gruff, laconic friend and mentor with a great mix of gentle humour and strong charisma. Honestly, it's just a joy to listen to, and he lends the game both gravitas and levity as required. I think we're going to need a bigger sword. Mine's bigger. Thank you, Clive, but I meant that figuratively. The core's clearly made of sterner stuff. Oh, and side note, Ralph Einstein also popped up in Diablo 4 in 2023, which was a very welcome surprise. Of course, for my money, he didn't have the same quality of writing to work with in that game, but he still did a great job. Christopher York and Stuart Clark play Gav and Dion respectively, and in some ways they're polar opposites as characters, but to my mind they're equally crucial to the world of the game. Gav is loud, energetic and cheerful, usually cheerful at least, and when he's not, well, that's when you can really feel the depth of his emotion. And long after me tenth name day, my mum told us she was with child again. 
<laughs> I was over the fucking moon. I was looking forward to having a little one to lord it over. What with me being the runt of the litter. I thought I'd finally have a chance to prove to the world that I could be a big brother. I'd almost call him the heart of the whole game. He's not the protagonist, but he is perhaps the character who feels and understands most deeply the struggles that the protagonists face. He's the one who truly counts the cost of victory, but also knows what it means for the world. If you've seen the end of the game, you might know what I'm talking about. Dion, in contrast, is stern and stoic, a man of relatively few words, but when he speaks, you can't help but listen. But there is a reservoir of passion within him which makes itself known only in key moments. More than that. Bahamut is the champion of the Empire. When our people look to the heavens, the sight of him gives them hope. And I want to stress, as I did in my video on FF16 a while back, how great it is to see an openly gay character in a Final Fantasy game. Now I realise I'm mostly listing character traits here rather than the qualities of the voice actors behind these characters, but the thing is, the fact that they are able to bring those traits to life so compellingly and so believably is truly a testament to their skill. Yes, the writing is good, as is the animation and the motion capture, but those things can only go so far towards creating excellent video game characters. The voice actors have to pull everything together. Lastly, the main protagonist, I want to mention Susanna Fielding as Jill. In some ways, this may be the most difficult role in the game. How could I forget? You saw me crying and thought a change of scenery might lift my spirits. In the end, it earned me a nasty cough and a stern scolding from your mother. But I felt wonderful nonetheless. She is Clive's closest friend and later his lover, but their romance is lower key than you might expect from a melodramatic high fantasy video game. The way their relationship is depicted is mature and grounded. It's something that grows from deep roots and wraps itself around trauma and tragedy. Jewel, perhaps more than any other character in the game, suffers deeply during the untold years between the game's prologue and main narrative, and this is something that informs her character but does not overpower it. For years I followed your orders, fought your wars, all to protect the children you took, just as you took me. Together, Clive and Jill build a bond that is arguably deeper and more believable than any other couple in Final Fantasy history. And this is something that you can hear in their voices, particularly as the game nears its end. Once again, if you know, you know. Of course, Final Fantasy games are known for their villains, and 16 contains some real doozies. Do the kids still say doozies? Well, they should. My favourites are undoubtedly Nina Indus and Alex Lanapekin as Benedicta and Hugo. They have a fiery relationship that is summed up perfectly in a scene very near the start of the game. You cock. <laughs> Benedicto. <laughs> take care. Does the lion take care when he chases the hare? Or do you think me one of the latter? No, my love. You are a lion. You're my lion. <laughs> This scene was honestly the moment when I realised just how much skill and effort had gone into creating these characters, and although, as I said before, it's the voice actors who have to pull everything together, I do also want to acknowledge the insane skill that's gone into the animation, motion capture, and general design of these characters. These two are undeniably bad guys, but neither of them are unsympathetic. Benedicta in particular might have deserved better in life, even if she did nearly kill the dog. What a good boy he is. A much less sympathetic villain is Ultima, the game's mysterious big bad, played by Harry Lloyd. As an implacable, unknowable, inhuman being, his voice is flat, almost lifeless, but I find it creepy and effective. We visited upon it a miracle, magic, and in its light did all life flourish. Somewhere in between in terms of sympathetic characters is David Menken as Barnabas Tharm. He is pretty damn evil and kind of mad, but at least his diabolical plans make a certain kind of sense. Minkin's performance is soft-spoken, almost despairing, as befits a character who has essentially given up on hope. Indeed, you may kneel before Barnabas Tharm, Warden of Ash and King of Walud. 
And if I was going to give an award for the actor who least resembles their character in real life, it would definitely go to Mencken, who, from what I can tell, is not soft-spoken and definitely not close to despairing. And of course there are loads of other characters who are more than deserving of a mention, but this video would be literally hours long if I gave everyone the plaudits they deserve. I do however want to single out Quentin Ballard as Olivia. This is his only credited role on IMDb, he's obviously quite young, but for whatever reason his delivery of this line in particular has really stayed with me. Go, Bahamut. Kinslayer. I truly find it chilling. Well, that covers the voice performances I particularly wanted to talk about, but as I suggested earlier, there are other reasons that 2023 really seemed to me to be the year of the voice actor. For one thing, the world just seems more aware of voice actors as people and as celebrities. I guess this is largely because my world in particular consists mostly of games and gaming, and my social media feeds are fine-tuned to show me this sort of thing. But for me at least, this was the first time I really considered myself a true fan of voice actors. And that started with Ben Starr, particularly his appearance on the PlayStation Access podcast. He seemed like such an eloquent, intelligent, down-to-earth guy, and his passion for the Final Fantasy series clearly rivaled my own. Hearing him talk about his experiences with Final Fantasy VIII, which happens to also be my favourite single-player Final Fantasy game, and what it meant to him was something I found genuinely moving. We were offered this window into these worlds that were interactive, that were beautiful, that sounded amazing, and that's what, especially when I discovered it on PS1, Final Fantasy VIII, Seven, Nine, those things just, they were telling stories in a way that I had never experienced before. He knows what the series means to its fans because he is one of us. Incidentally, as I was writing this, he turned up on the PlayStation Access channel again, this time in their annual Crystal Maze challenge, and it was also delightfully cringy, or cringingly delightful. Either way, it made for compelling viewing. You have 45 minutes. Okay. Now, if something goes awry, you can reset. You can reset, but it will cost you one question. Oh. Mm. The stakes couldn't be higher! Okay, so. Ben Starr gained even more respect for me when he was asked at an award show if 2023 was the best year for games and gave an unexpectedly serious answer that was a world away from the glib responses you usually get at events like this. I think it's not a great year for video games insofar as all of the layoffs. I think it's not great for that, and I think it, that does need to be spoken about at an event like this. I think we want to celebrate all of these games, but maybe there is something missing uh, because a lot of people who made those games are no longer working at those companies. But he's appeared in lighter hearted stuff too, such as this video with Ralph Einstein, aka Sid. I have fans, and they recognize my adorable soft center and my fantastical quirkiness. They probably just like your abs. Everyone likes my abs. We discuss this. And who are these fans of yours? The same people who call you Zaddy. And this hilarious one with a large chunk of the FF16 cast. Five. Fuck me, Dion! If you wouldn't mind, Dion, we're just... Lord Rosfield, please, take this flower. Uh, thank you. And one for the Hound. Can you knock next time? The fans have really embraced the entire cast and they've responded in kind. The Baldur's Gate 3 community have really taken that game's voice actors in as their own too. This is something that Larian, the developers, seem to have really taken notice of, and they've bestowed upon us some truly hilarious animations featuring the original voice cast. Technically this is promotional material and it could cynically be said that they're just exploiting the player base's love of the characters and the performers behind them. But hell, even if that's true, I'm just glad that the actors are getting more work and that the results are so amusing, regardless of whether it's advertising. Indeed, many of the actors from Baldur's Gate have been popping up all over the place, on Twitch, on podcasts, on their own YouTube channels. I particularly want to highlight Amelia Tyler's channel, where she's uploaded some incredibly funny outtakes from her time as the game's narrator. Today's episode of Baldur's Gate 3 is sponsored by A Mental Breakdown and the number 2. Welcome to Fantasy Spelling, kids. Think you know how to pronounce it? <laughs> I think not. Sight read this, bitch. I swear she has the most inherently funny voice I've ever heard. By which I don't mean it sounds weird, I just mean it's the perfect voice for saying funny things. I mean, she could make me laugh just by reading the phone book. 
<laughs> it's a tiny groovy spider. Tiny dancing spiders are in your eyes. But that's the thing. If that occurred in this script, it wouldn't be like a what? It'd just be like, oh, okay. Dancing eye spiders. Why not? Sure. Must be Thursday. Dancing eye spiders is the most normal thing I've done all day. Oh, and you're a big scary player character. What level are you now? Is it two? Oh, you were so scary. You were so scary. <laughs> I know it's probably got more to do with the algorithm showing me what it thinks I want to see, but my Twitter timeline has just been full of cast members from both FF16 and Baldur's Gate 3, and it's been fantastic to see so many of them adopted so warmly into the gaming community. The players love the characters for a reason, and they love the actors too, and that love seems to be reciprocated. If you'll forgive me for getting a little sappy, it really has been heartwarming. Well, I mainly just wanted to express some of my appreciation and admiration for the voice actors who helped to make this one of the best years for gaming of all time. And I guess I've done that, even if there are still loads of others I feel guilty about not mentioning. Like Jonathan Case as Joshua in FF16 for example, a fantastic performance for a vital character. Or Maggie Robertson as Oren in BG3, probably the creepiest and most outright evil character in either game. And no, I really do need to stop. But I'd be interested to know who you think gave the best performances in games this year from FF16 and BG3, or from anything else really. There truly was so much talent on display. For now though, get off my lawn.